The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 11. Not, sloth, sloth, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Good morning. One of my favorite things growing up was uh, something we called pew packers. And pew packers, I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. Maybe you called it by a, a different name. But what pew packers was, was a uh, event that happened with the, the young kids at church that uh, before the evening services, all of the kids would pack the front pews and they would sit on the front and then they would all uh, sing and uh, they would quote scriptures and they would, they would answer these Bible questions. And I remember I loved it because the guy that did it said, whoever sings the loudest gets candy. And so, of course, me and uh, my good friend at the time, Michael, you know, we're about you know, six or seven years old and we're sitting on the, the front pew and we didn't care who was walking in the back door or how loud that we were being, we were screeching and hollering at the top of our voices all of these church songs that, uh, that we were singing. And then we would always try and jump on the Bible questions and see who could answer it first. And there was this excitement and there was this enthusiasm that was going. Maybe it was because there was candy, but there was a lot of excitement and enthusiasm that went into what we were doing. And it's very interesting to me uh, to notice uh, as you have these young kids and even and teenagers uh, that are growing up in the church and sometimes it seems like there's this bright enthusiasm and there's all of this energy into what they're doing and who they are and what they're a part of and there's just so much joy and you know there are some adults that just you know they kind of maybe take this uh, pessimistic attitude like well just wait till life hits. Just wait till the taxes hit. Just wait for all of the trials and tribulations that they're going to run into and that spirit's going to die. And I don't know who puts it that way or maybe who approaches it from that direction, but I remember I used to speak at this congregation uh, and it was a small congregation and a lady came up to me and just said, you can do a lot of good uh, and where you are in life right now because you're still young and nothing terrible has happened to you. And it was kind of like, enjoy it. Because when the bad things hit, it's like you are just going to lose your passion and you're going to lose your enthusiasm. And right now you're the most effective that you will ever be. And sometimes maybe we don't talk about it that way or we don't say it that way, but we adopt this attitude uh, about you know, this youthful maybe ignorance that's attached to that enthusiasm. This morning we're going to talk about enthusiasm, building and maintaining zeal for the Lord. There's PowerPoint, may or may not happen. But we're going to talk about maintaining and building this enthusiasm for God because the fact is, there is a lot to be enthusiastic about. There is a lot to be zealous about and passionate for if you are living the life of a Christian. And that kind of lifestyle and that zeal and that passion and enthusiasm doesn't have to die when you get too old for pew packers. That enthusiasm, that passion doesn't have to die when uh, you leave a lectureship or a youth rally or a camp or any, you know, a season in life. Right now, you know, it's a sunny day, but leading up to this point, it has been very dreary outside and it's been really foggy. And in the winter, especially in the south, it seems, it just gets really damp and cold and wet. And sometimes uh, that it's the season that we're in can affect our uh, enthusiasm, zeal, passion, or because we're just not feeling it. There's no sunshine. It seems like all hope is lost at, at times. But I want to talk about what uh, mature passion and enthusiasm can do, not only for the church, but for the individual, and how we can maintain that and keep it. If you look throughout the Bible, even in the Old Testament and New Testament, you see that there are a lot of these, these heroes of faith that start off uh, very zealous or very uh, passionate, and then you see those moments in their lives where they hit rock bottom or they go through this difficult trial, and at some point it seems like they're almost just broken. But one of my favorite things to do in reading through the Bible is to see how God then picks up these individuals and helps them to become who they were meant to be. And all of it points back to God. We just sang a song before this. It was not planned, I don't think. Uh, it, you know, this world is not my home. 
And you think about all of what we have as Christians and all of the blessings and the gifts that we have because of God and who God has made us and how much we have to be enthusiastic about and passionate about, but sometimes that's missing. We may have seasons or we may have points where we are very enthusiastic and passionate, but we may go through something that maybe it seems like it's just crushed our spirit. If you don't know where to start in a daily Bible reading program, or maybe you're in a hurry, or you just, you're kind of new to starting that habit or getting into that, I would suggest going through and looking at the Psalms and Proverbs. Both of those two books that we have in the Bible and the Old Testament are very beneficial. Um, and you don't have to read very much before you run into uh, these very profound truths that can affect your life and give you a new perspective and really a kickstart to the day. And while you can say pretty much in every lesson or class that you hear, all the application can usually be read your Bible and pray, I want to talk a little bit about some of the practical ways that we can maintain and build enthusiasm no matter what age you are, no matter where you are in life. You see this young uh, enthusiasm in David when you look in... 1 Samuel chapter 17, you have this young guy uh, who approaches this battle scene, or this it's about to be a battle at some point. They're kind of dragging their feet because uh, there's intimidation that's going on there. But you have the Philistines, and you have God's people, and you have David who's a shepherd, and he's going up to tend to his older brothers to bring them food to help them out. And when he gets up there, he finds out about the giant Goliath. This is one of the more popular accounts that happened in the Old Testament. But you have him running up to this battlefield, and his his brothers basically ridicule him and criticize him for being fascinated with violence and warfare and being immature. But if you notice the way that David even approaches this, first of all, when he approaches it, he is upset that this Philistine is defying and insulting the God of creation in Israel. And so you see this zeal and enthusiasm because even though he's young, he still knows this is wrong. The king's not doing anything. God's people aren't doing anything. And David seems to already have a knowledge that God can overcome everything that they're facing. And we find out later that as a shepherd, he has uh, tackled you know, lions and, and wolves and, and wild animals to try and protect his flock. And so he has seen the power of God in his life, but he doesn't really have a whole lot of life experience ahead of him. But he still has that enthusiasm. And even down to the way that he approaches Goliath, he runs towards him. Because in his mind, the battle is already won. The victory has already happened. If you are a Christian this morning, if you're a part of God's church, the battle's already won. The victory is already ours. We sing songs like, you know, this world is not my home. Or we sing things like, you know, nothing but the blood of Jesus washing away our sins and the amazing life that we have as Christians. But where is the enthusiasm sometimes? You talk to anybody that's passionate about uh, their hobbies and what they like to do, and it's, it's like you can see them kind of light up. If, if you talk to someone uh, who is maybe a little bit introverted, and it seems like, you know, I, I really don't know what to talk to this person about, but you find an interest of that person if, they, you know, if they're not the most outgoing person in the world. And it doesn't matter. If they're interested in it, if they're passionate about it, then they're going to talk about it. And it's the same way as Christians. What matters to us is going to show in our speech and through our actions. Does the world know that we are excited and passionate and thankful that we're Christians? We hear all the time about you know, how many blessings that we have and what God has done for His church and for us as, as Christians. But sometimes that doesn't make its way out into our speech and into our conversations and into our lives. Zeal has power. Passion has power. But we're going to look at, at a few things uh, about zeal and how it can be uh, misused and how it can be a little bit abused. But first I want to define it a little bit. Zeal in the New Testament is the Greek word zeo. And that word means to boil over or to burn hot. And it's a very interesting word because it, it describes basically the attitude that the person takes on when they have zeal. They're boiling over. And it can be either a positive thing or it can be a negative. You can boil over or you can be zealous and be very angry. And you can be zealous about all of the wrong things or you can boil over and you can be passionate about uh, the right things with that being uh, God in the Christian life and Christian living. Somewhere along the lines, it's, maybe it seems like 
zeal is smothered or it goes missing. And some very common enemies of zeal can show itself. Like, you know, you have an enthusiastic kid that gets up to lead a song and the song is off key. And so, you know, his peers embarrass him afterwards and say, like, you led that way too high. I was known in the youth group and uh, when I was younger for having a very high-pitched voice. And sometimes I try and overcompensate with that by just speaking a little bit lower than I have to. But I would, I'd get nervous. And when I got up there, the song would go five pitches higher than it was supposed to. And you can see the train wreck happening, but you didn't really have the confidence to stop the song and start over. And so you're seeing, you know, maybe when you get down to the chorus and you see where the, the note's going to go up really high and you already know that it's way too high where you are now. And you can see that note coming as you're going down the page and you're like, this is going to be a wreck. And I've done that several times. And I remember even, there's probably, there's been a few times here where I've gotten up and tried to lead a song and it has gone terribly. But what happens sometimes is, you know, you have a young kid or you have someone who's just starting out and they're enthusiastic and they're passionate and they're willing to get up and do something, but they get down and maybe it's their own peers uh, that embarrass them or discourage them from ever getting up and doing that again. Or you have a willing young man who gets up and decides that he's going to do something that's very uncomfortable to him, and that's uh, to speak in public. And so he gets up, and he's already very nervous. And again, I'm getting PTSD talking about it. And you misquote a scripture. Or you quote somebody, and you don't give a reference because either you're nervous or you don't know who it was, and you just kind of go over it. And then afterwards, you have someone who comes up in the name of trying to be uh, helpful is very critical and comes across in the wrong way and discourages you from ever wanting to do that again. Of course, we can think about the new Christian as an example who comes up out of the water and they're so excited and they're on fire because they've been touched by the gospel and they've heard that life-saving message. And so as soon as they come up, uh, they, they're so excited, but when they dry off, they go right back into the world and it's just gone. Or you have the, the new Christian that's lacking knowledge. And so in order to try and grow, and in that process of trying to grow, may use some terms that may be, you know, denominational or not entirely correct. And instead of giving that grace and patience and realizing that this is a new brother or sister in Christ, maybe sometimes we jump on them and say, That's you, that word does not mean what you think it is. That term does not mean what you think it is. And so, you know, we're very critical of that person, and then they feel defeated or that enthusiasm just dies. Zeal in the church. It's a growing process. In the beginning, it's very immature. I remember coming up out of school with my entire class. It graduated from preaching school, and as soon as we got out and we were all looking at, you know, what jobs we would take or the works that we're going to jump into, and, you know, we had this innocence about us almost because we had no idea what we were getting into, and then we got into ministry, and all of a sudden, this is not what I envisioned in my head. You know, people don't always love me. You know, people don't think I'm the, the greatest person in the entire world. People don't always appreciate you. And sometimes you have what they call burnout. And burnout doesn't just happen with ministers. It happens with members, too. And it happens with other leaders in the church as well. The enthusiasm and the passion and the zeal can die. But it's a growing process. But we're going to talk a little bit about how that grows and some ways that we can implement that into our life. Enthusiasm and passion often presents itself in an emotion. It can influence our actions to the point that uh, many people throughout history have either accomplished these great things because of this, or they've done some very terrible things because of it. It wasn't focused. It was the, the zeal and the passion that they had was misplaced. You have a minor example of this uh, in um, Acts chapter 19 where you have Apollos who gets up there and he's, he's willing and he's passionate and he's enthusiastic and he's preaching, but he doesn't exactly have all the facts. And his gospel that he's preaching is not really complete because he's preaching that gospel of John. And so you have a very critical changing point in Apollo's life as you read about him in the New Testament a little bit later on. You have Priscilla and Aquila who come up to him and approach him in the right way. They take him aside, first of all, they don't embarrass him and say, Oh man, you just made a fool of yourself. You just got up and preached you know, this passionate and, and zealous lesson and you had all of that wrong. They didn't say that. They taught him. They took him aside. They did it with a lot of tact. 
and helped Apollos grow in that zeal and in that passion. And they helped fan that, that flame and helped him uh, to become the uh, follower of Christ that he was. One of my favorite sections in the New Testament is Acts chapter 4 where you have Peter and John who are walking into uh, the leaders and the elders of the people and they're standing before this intimidating crowd of um, theological intellects. Basically, they walk in there and uh, they're in front of all of these leaders and they have the nerve to preach with such passion and zeal. And you read before that they're preaching Christ. They're talking about the cornerstone and what uh, their lives are supposed to be built off and what, who we're supposed to be as people and what we were created for. And they were amazed. They were amazed at the passion and at the zeal that they had, the confidence that they had in preaching God's Word. Paul turns from one zealous extreme to the next. He was persecuting Christians and he was throwing them in prison and chasing them down because he was passionate and he was zealous for God, but it was misguided. But as soon as he grew in that faith and in that zeal for the Lord and he uh, learned a few things that uh, he was doing wrong, he became a very powerful force for the church. Biblical zeal. It's a power. Zeal has power. Zeal has power in the Christian life. When that passion and that enthusiasm rubs off of us, it can either tear down or it can build up depending on what we're passionate and zealous about. God can use the power of passion and enthusiasm to change the world, to change congregations and to change people's life. But we have to believe it. We have to believe in the power of God and we have to believe in, in how we're living and the lifestyle that we've chosen as Christians. If we come to know God, if we truly believe in that power and the forgiveness of sins that we have and the hope of heaven that we have, the more that we come to realize and recognize that this is fact and not just you know, a good book that we're reading that has some good things for us and maybe some good uh, morals to follow, some general guidelines, when it changes from just general guidelines to this is how I'm living my life and this is what I'm living my life for, there's power behind it. In the book of Romans, you have Paul who's uh, writing several different things, and he seems, as you read through it, to jump around from topic to topic, but it's actually very logical in the layout that he has. And, and chapter 11, and then the two chapters that are following that, it's basically just talking about uh, how to implement theology and religion and God into your life. And I love, uh, Janelle makes fun of me for it, but I love bullet points, and I love as practical and as simple as possible. When you get into Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul is basically taking all of the things that he's talked about. It's the so what or the so then section of the book here where he talks about this is what this faith should look like in your life. This is what uh, God looks like when he is uh, introduced into your life. And so he says in 9, let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful or slow in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. And he's talking about this all in the midst of persecution where they could rattle off problem after problem of what they're going through. And Paul has problems of his own. We already knew that he had a thorn in the flesh and he was weak because of that, but allowed God to use his power in his life despite that weakness. He's going through all of his own personal problems and yet he still says through the inspiration of God, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Be fervent in spirit. Don't be slow to zeal. Don't be slow to passion because this is what is important. This life is all we have. And when you're talking, you know, when you're looking at the, the bulletin or you're hearing all these announcements about the different health problems that show up in our lives or even sometimes we hear those, those tragic events that happen where you have someone who was young who wasn't able to live out his entire life and was, you know, his life or her life was cut short. And we have those brief reminders where we go, wow, we're, we're not promised tomorrow. We don't know how many years we have left. And so behind that you have Paul talking about you know, these persecutions that they're facing and the trials that they have. And he's basically acknowledging the fact that we are mortal. So what are we doing with our time here? Be passionate. Be fervent in spirit. Before this, he opens up in 1 and through 3, I believe it is, or at least around there, talks about 
that what we have in Christ and what Christ did for us in taking away that sin. And then he talks about uh, following right on the, on the heels of that. He starts talking about uh, his sorrow that he has for his brothers and or for his, the other people that are in the world around him that have heard the message of Christ, that have heard uh, that gospel preached, and yet they haven't done anything about it. And they haven't accepted that. And so he, he mourns over that a little bit. And then he moves into this section here talking about what it looks like for Christ to be in your life. How often does that show up in our conversations? Is there really a difference in our lives? And I know that sometimes there is and sometimes there isn't just based on where we're at or what we're going through. It's very easy to become self-absorbed in your own problems or in your work or what you're focused on at the moment. But how often does this section, like Romans chapter 12, how often does that show up in our life? When people look at us and they see that genuine love, and when those, those temptations of evil come up, they see that we do abhor that evil. And we're always talking about Christ and what He's done for us and how God can transform your life. One of the things I love about Christianity in general is that it seems like God has an answer for everything. And you don't have to rely on your own knowledge or your own even life experience. And I've heard uh, some, some ministers and some even members talk about how they feel like they can be effective as servants and as uh, speakers for God because of all the terrible things that they've done. And I believe that there is a time and a place for that. But I also believe that you don't have to have a terrible past. You don't have to have done all of those terrible things to gain experience so that you can relate and talk about how amazing Christ is. So don't think that you have to go through these terrible things or maybe if you're just you know, sowing your wild oats or whatever excuse that you may have. But yes, you can use those things. And Paul certainly did himself. But what Paul is trying to get across, even though you see uh, some of that, like we're talking about 1 Corinthians, and you see more of that harsh tone that Paul has uh, with the churches that he's talking to, you can look at sections like Romans chapter 12 and see the passion and the zeal and the fervent spirit that he had despite his circumstances. Because Christ meant something to him. We see biblical zeal starts off with a choice. Biblical zeal starts off with a choice. In 1 Kings chapter 18, you have uh, Elijah who uh, makes this bold statement right, bef you know, right before he ends up running for his life and feeling very discouraged and very depressed himself. But he preaches this lesson to all of these idol worships, the worshipers of Baal. And you can see the passion and zeal that he has. And he says, how long will you halt between two opinions? The word halt there means to dance in between or to use crutches. So how long are you going to dance on crutches between God and between the Baals? And so he basically, you know, his, the, the point of his sermon, if, if Baal's God, then follow him. But if the Lord is God, then follow him. It involves a choice. We have to make that choice. When you look through the entire Bible, you know, we're talking about an, an OT1 or uh, Old Testament 101 right now. And we see that the, the consequences of their actions are based on how their relationship was with God. If they were with God, then everything was going great. If they were against God, or if they were rebelling against God, or if they were becoming self-absorbed and thinking about their own wants and their needs, then that relationship started to crumble, and their life started to go very, very badly. But when you look in uh, the, the entire message of the Bible, you have the saved and you have the unsaved. And then you have the wise and you have the foolish. Christianity involves a choice. Being zealous, being enthusiastic has to be a choice. Because there are going to be days and there are going to be times, months, or even years where we don't feel like it. And while there's a, a time and a place for feelings, and there's definitely a lot of feeling that's involved in our relationship with God and with the church and with the family, Christianity is not a feelings-based religion. We don't serve God when we feel like it. We don't serve God when we feel good. Our relationship with Him should not be based on how we're feeling in the moment because as Paul also talks about in the book of Romans, uh, that's pretty shallow. Because there's always going to be trials and there's always going to be these persecutions that are going to show up in one form or another. So we have this example of a choice. You have two opinions. If Baal's God, follow Him. If the Lord is God, then follow Him. And today we have the same thing. If you are God, then follow you. 
But if God is God, then follow Him and do it wholeheartedly. We also see that zeal involves growth, which we've talked about a little bit. But that's what builds that passion. And the more that you know about God, you can't help it. Jeremiah describes this zeal and, and this enthusiasm that he had as a fire in his bones. But you look at the overall ministry of Jeremiah and the things that he went through and his own family uh, rejecting him and even wanting to kill him at one point. And he preaches and he preaches and he preaches and there's no response. And no one seems to recognize the power of God like Jeremiah does. He has this relationship and he's pleading with this people to accept that and to have that relationship with God themselves. But he says that this message that he has, this knowledge of God, is a fire in his bones. Proverbs 19, verse 2. Like I said, if you're looking for a place to start, Psalms and Proverbs are great. Proverbs 19, verse 2 says, Zeal without knowledge is not good. Because passion in and of itself can just be a feeling. But if you have a lot of feeling, and if you have a lot of enthusiasm, and no knowledge to back it, or any guidance on where to go, then that can be very harmful. Zeal without knowledge is not good. Developing this knowledge, growing in your faith, is very essential. Sometimes, I know it's, it's definitely true with preachers, but maybe it's true with the church all around, is we, we look at success as how many people we've gotten wet in a baptistry. You know, it's uh, how many points you can get throughout the year. Well, we've had five baptisms, so we've had five points, you know, added to our church. But that's not where it stops. It shouldn't stop at baptism. You don't baptize somebody and be like, all right, we did it, we're done. There has to be that follow-up and that growing process because as you are all well know, or all, all of you know very well, is that when people come up out of those waters of baptism, if there is no follow-up and growth, then they very quickly leave and go back to their old ways. Zeal has to be a growing process, and with that knowledge, the zeal and passion only grows because that relationship with the Father has grown with it. But it also involves pushing past those fears. Passion motivates us to push past the, the fears that are, are holding us back. Those uncomfortable conversations. Those intimidating circumstances that we might find ourselves in. When you have that passion, that zeal that's backed by that knowledge and backed by that growth, then it helps us to overcome that fear. It doesn't mean that the fear gets any easier. Because... I love talking to people, uh, and I love you know, having these conversations, but there's still that, that initial fear that's always there that's also kept me from reaching out to people in the past before. Because simply, maybe it's embarrassing to admit, but it's scary. And it's a little bit uncomfortable. But that growth process, that knowledge, the more you know about God, that's when it becomes that fire in your bones that you can't hold it back. You can't develop these relationships with people that are out in the world and recognize the fact that they're separated from God and know that their eternity is not a very bright one. You can't have that kind of knowledge and without that producing some kind of passion that helps you push past that fear. But it's not just all fear in general because you have Matthew 10.28 that talks about you know, uh, fearing God who can destroy uh, the soul. There has to be that fear of God, but not fear of man. And really that, that becomes almost uh, an insult to God in seeing that you know, we, we place more power and control in people than what God has. But we also see that in order to grow zeal, there has to be a hunger for righteousness. There has to be a hunger, a healthy appetite. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And uh, I'm probably already know this, I, I love documentaries and I love animals and I'm not ashamed of it. And uh, maybe I, I watched a little bit too much, but I was watching this one documentary and you had this albatross uh, called the Wandering Albatross and they, it was, it was touching. It was very nice. But it was uh, these two parents that spent their entire life all about family. They were dedicated to each other, so they had one mate. And so they, once they had a, this chick together, they would fly for miles and miles and miles and spend up all of their energy just trying to take care of this one chick that they had. And so they would fly over the ocean, and how they would feed these little babies is they would, they would scoop down in the water with their beaks and you know, get fish and squid and other things that baby albatrosses eat and would bring it back to the babies and feed them and then as soon as they were fed they would take back off and they would go and tirelessly work. But sometimes the adults would swoop down and they would scoop up trash in the ocean 
and then they would fly back to the babies and they would feed them trash and they can't digest it so they don't grow and they don't mature and some of them end up dying because of it. There has to be a hunger for righteousness. We can't just feed that passion and that zeal with anything. It has to be healthy. It has to be a good diet of righteousness. Number five, maybe this is a little bit uh, of a no-duh. But surrounding yourself with those that are on fire for God can help build and maintain your zeal. Surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with good company. They say or a bad company corrupts good morals, but that good company encourages good morals. Some might say, you know, I don't have any good friends. Well, be the good friend. Be the good company. Don't contribute to the problem. I, I can't tell you how many times that I've seen it happen in other Christians' lives and also in my own life where you're feeling a little bit down, you're feeling a little bit discouraged, and all of a sudden you talk to uh, a good friend or a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ who are very, very uh, fervent, very enthusiastic, and it kind of just lights your fire again. I love spending time uh, with my family because my, my dad's the exact way. I was over there this weekend and we were talking and just talking to him about ministry. He didn't really know about you know, anything that you know, I you know, was struggling with or anything. He just sat there and simply talked about his ministry. And because the, the work that he's in in Kentucky is a new one, he was excited about it and he's enthusiastic about it. And you have that new work uh, that he's getting into and it just rubbed off on me. And so writing back, you know, I just felt a whole lot better knowing that, you know, I had been with somebody who was passionate and who was zealous for God and for His work. I'm very blessed to have a lot of brothers and sisters right here in this congregation who are the exact same way. I've sat down with several of you over lunch or gone over to your house or just come into the office and started talking. And you've left, and maybe you knew it, maybe you didn't know it, but when you left, I felt a whole lot better than before you got there because we sat and we talked about the work of the church. And we talked about some different ways that we can overcome uh, some problems. And we prayed together and we talked about the mission of the church and our entire purpose of life, which is Christ. We have to surround ourselves with good people, those that are on fire for God so that our zeal and enthusiasm doesn't die and that we can remain fervent in spirit. Number six, determination. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 is a very similar verse that you might read in, in other passages as well, but it says, if anyone wishes to come after me, you have to have that desire. If you wish to come after Christ, there's that desire again. They have to pick up their cross, and the one in Luke says daily. Pick up your cross daily. See, without that daily denial of self, then that zeal and that passion for the Lord is going to be smothered because it's a daily decision. And sacrificing self is not an easy thing to do, but there has to be that determination. So you make the choice first, I'm going to do this for Christ. I'm going to be enthusiastic. I'm going to be fervent. I'm going to spread it. I'm going to overcome these fears. I'm going to keep growing through it, and I'm going to be determined to do it on a daily basis. Sometimes... Zeal is forgotten, and when it's forgotten, it has to be found again. We have to remind ourselves, it seems like, uh, several times. We have to 